whether we have a policy that we represent or whether we have both. That's what this Venn diagram represents. If we have a value function, if we represent that value function, we call it value-based. If we have a, a policy that we represent, we call it policy-based. And if we have both of these things in our algorithm, we'll call it an actor critic. Okay? Um, and epsilon greedy, epsilon greedy is something we do when we, when we live in this side of the diagram. Epsilon greedy, we don't actually explicitly represent the policy. Instead, we use a simple trick, which is we say, if we've got the value function, if we've got Q, we're just going to act greedily with respect to Q and sometimes act randomly. What we're considering now in this lecture is an alternative approach, which is to actually learn directly how to pick actions and parameterize the policy. So instead of doing greedy or epsilon greedy, we're directly parameterizing the policy. We're deciding how to pick those actions. And we want to figure out, well, if I pick my actions in a particular way, will I get more reward? Will I get less reward? Um, and, um, and so they we're actually in a different space here altogether, where we're directly parameterizing things. So there's no greedy, there's no epsilon greedy anymore. But if, um, you, if you parameterize your policy to be like greedy over your Q, over your value function? If you parameterize it, so that's like an implicit parameterization, which I would say is what we call value-based here. So it's like if, we, if we're basically saying our policy is the thing which is acting greedily with respect to my value function, yeah. That's purely value-based. Yeah. We're not explicitly so, representing but, the policy. But does that algorithm still work? The, the is there a way to recover exactly. like a, does, a like pure value-based method? Like, you know. um, there's a result which says that basically, um, for a particular class of, of, of uh, policy gradient algorithms that we'll see shortly, uh, it turns out that if you take the limiting case where you make your step size bigger, so for all of these policy gradient algorithms, there's some step that you take in the direction of the gradient. And you could ask the question, what happens if you take an infinite step in the direction of that gradient? Um, so if we just get back to where we are. So in all of these algorithms, there's some, there's some gradient update where we update our parameters a little bit in the direction of our score. And for a certain class of policy gradient algorithms, if you make this thing infinitely large, um, then it actually takes you to a greedy step. So that's true for certainly for natural gradient algorithms, which we'll see later. So the step size is what kind of controls how greedy you are. So think about the softmax policy, okay? This thing where we were exponentiating some score. If you take a, if you see that like, one of these actions appears to be a little bit better than the other, um, so, so you, had a, you had some policy where you were taking this left more often than right, and now you see something where left actually did even better than right, so you, you saw a good score for this guy. What are you gonna do? Um, well, you're going to push yourself a little bit in the direction that makes left even more probable and right less probable. If you make your step size infinite, you'll push the probability of going right all the way down to zero and the probability of going left all the way up to one, um, which is equivalent to acting greedily. So there is a limiting case where you recover kind of greedy, greediness, and the step size is what controls the smoothness. Um, so, so it's certainly true for some algorithms. Yeah, I'll take one more question and then we've gone. So, so when, when you were learning a value function, yeah. You had the development operator being a contraction, and so you had you knew you were going to get to the optimal value. Yeah. Um, do you have the same thing here? Because you could have uh, suboptimal sort of modes. In your okay, this is a really great question. So the question was, you know, if we're using policy gradient methods, do we still have the same guarantees that we'll find a unique global optimum, or could we get trapped in some local optimum? Um, so it turns out that at least in the case where we're using, so you could consider table lookup representations of policy. Um, so let's consider the table lookup case. In the table lookup case, you can represent your value function by having one value for each state. Um, and if you use the Bellman um, equation, you get a contraction, you guarantee that you get a global um, optimum. Um, with policy-based methods, if you just follow the gradient, for example, with a softmax, it's known that for the softmax um, that you also find the global optimum in the table lookup case. So if you have a softmax, which is like a separate softmax parameters for each state, you also achieve a local optimum. Now, for the case where you've got some more general function approximator, um, it's clear that if you've got something like a neural net, neither method will guarantee that you find a global optimum. You can always get trapped in some kind of local optimum. For certain special cases in between, it's unclear, and I think it's an open research question, actually. Right. OK. So. So we're still in this space where we've got like, this basic principle. We've got this family of actor-critic methods. We've got this family where the actor is basically picking the actions. We've got some policy. We're using that to pick the actions. And we've got some um, critic, which is basically evaluating those things and saying you know, whether those actions are good or bad, and then actually 
the actor moves in the direction suggested by the critic. That's the basic idea of all of these. But what we want to do is to make these things better. So we're considering now, now some, some tricks to make, make this thing better. So the first trick, and the, perhaps the easiest and best known trick, is, is to reduce variance using what's called a baseline. Um, so the idea is to subtract some baseline function from the policy gradient. And this can actually be done in a way that doesn't change the, the direction of, of ascent. In other words, it changes the, it, it changes the variance of our estimator. Changes the, we can reduce the variance of this thing uh, without changing the expectation. Um, so another way to say that is that what we're going to do is we're going to subtract off some term which looks like this from our policy gradient. So our policy gradient was the score um, multiplied by the value function. And we're going to subtract off that. We're going to subtract off the score multiplied by some baseline function. And now we're going to choose that baseline function just to reduce the variance, to kind of make this thing mean zero, to make it roughly about the right scale so that, um, so that uh, we basically, you don't want to end up in situations where, where one moment you see a, a reward of a million, and the next moment you see a reward of 999,000. Um, and you have to kind of adjust in the direction where you're always moving a policy um, parameters up, but it's just the relative difference that determines how, how much up you should make them. It'd be much better to have like plus one or minus one um, and, and so this gives us a way to rescale things. Um, and so very, very briefly, what we see is that if we just expand this out, so our expectation is just, this again is our expectation over states, um, multiplied by the gradient of our policy, multiplied by the baseline. Um, we can pull um, the baseline outside of this sum because it doesn't depend on the action. Uh, we can pull the gradient outside of this sum and then we know that our policy sums up to 1. This is a probability distribution, so the probability distribution must sum to 1. Um, so now we have the gradient of 1. Gradient of a constant is always 0. Um, and so we see that this whole term here is actually 0. Right? This whole term that we're adding or subtracting is, is 0 mean. It's got 0 expectation. Okay? So it's completely legitimate to add or subtract any term of this form. So what that means is that we can basically, um, whenever we, we have our, our value function, which we, so if I go back, um, whenever we had our value function here, this was our, our policy gradient theorem. And our policy gradient theorem told us that the direction we really want to move is this score function multiplied by q. But now what this result tells us is that we can add or subtract anything we want from this q. As long as that thing is just a function of state and not a function of action, we can add or subtract anything we want from this so as to control the variance of this whole term here. We want this expectation to be low variance, uh, but we don't want to change the direction of, of ascent. Um, and so we can do that. And there's a particularly nice choice that we can pick for this thing, uh, which can have some nice consequences for us. Uh, and the particular baseline which we're going to choose is the state value function. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off with our q values, our action value function. And what we're going to do is subtract off the state value function. And what we're left with is something called the advantage function. This is something which tells us how much better than usual is it to take action A. So we basically, we're going to look at the Q value of action A, which tells us how good is it to go left if I'm in a particular state, compared to how good is it to be in that state in general. And that's, that tells us how much better than usual, how much more reward than usual will I get if I take a particular action. And so intuitively, that's just the right quantity to use in our, in our update. So we call this thing D, like the, the difference, the advantage function. Um, and so what we're going to do is now rewrite our, our policy gradient theorem in the following way. So this is still the policy gradient theorem. This is still just ground truth. We've just rewritten it by subtracting off a, a particular baseline function. Um, and so our policy gradient theorem we can rewrite as the expectation of the score multiplied by the advantage function. So again, let's, let's see if we can understand this intuitively. It's basically telling us, this tells us how much better than usual um, is a particular action A. And this tells us how to adjust our policy so as to achieve that action A. So if this thing is ever positive, if we ever do better than usual using a particular action A, this will tell us how to move in the direction that achieves that gain. If this thing is ever negative, this will move us in the opposite direction. 
away from the direction that, that achieves that particular action. So this is always pushing the policy parameters towards situations where you do better than usual. <coughs> okay, so that's the advantage function. <coughs> so again, we're just rewriting the same policy gradient theorem. So how do we estimate this advantage function now? How do we do this in our critic? Well, there's a lot, there's a lot of different ways to do this, actually, and I'm just going to suggest a couple of them. Um, so this slide is just to say, well, one way to do this would be to learn both Q and V. So our critic would basically learn Q. It could also learn V using yet another set of parameters. Um, and we would just take the difference between those things as our estimate of the advantage function. So we could basically do that. This becomes more complex in the sense we have more parameters. But it gives us a literal estimate of the advantage function, which we would then plug back in here. So we can plug into this policy gradient theorem here. We plug into this advantage function the difference between our, our, our state action value function and our action value function. <coughs> There's an easier way, and probably a better way, um, and that's what this second slide is about. Um, so this is probably the most commonly used variant of the actor critic, although it depends who you talk to, and many people use many different variants. Um, and it uses the following idea which is that the TD error is an, um, a sample of the advantage function. So consider the following TD error, this, D pi, this delta pi thing here. So if we knew the true value function V pi, then this basically sells, tells us that the TD error is equal to the reward plus the discounted true value at the next state minus the true value in the state I'm in. That's just the definition of this TD error. Now, in expectation, we can take the expectation of this whole thing. We can say, well, what's the expected TD error? And the expected TD error is the expected reward plus discounted value at the next state minus the value of the state I was in. The expectation doesn't affect this thing because there's no random variable in here. <coughs> S, was, S is what we're conditioning on. Um, this term here, the expected reward plus state value at the next state, given s, comma a, is precisely the definition of q. This is just like unrolling our Bellman equation one half step. Um, so q is equal to the expected state value at the next step. And so this whole thing here basically tells us that the TD error is an unbiased sample. We've basically got our q minus v now. This is the advantage function. This whole thing tells us that the TD error is an unbiased sample of the advantage function. So if we want to move in the direction of the advantage function, all we need to do is to measure the TD error and move a little bit in the direction of the TD error. In other words, if we ended up, I'm in a state where I think I'm winning a game, you know, I make an action, I find myself in a situation where I'm losing the game, so that generates a TD error. Um, these things were inconsistent. I now have to think, oh, well, I was probably losing the game all along. So you end up with this strong negative TD error it tells you you need to reduce your, your value estimate. And so now, what we're going to do is plug in that TD error as an estimate of the advantage to say that whatever I did on that step that generated that TD error, whatever move I made, uh, you know, it was probably a, a, a you know, bad idea. So there was something which I was in a situation where I took an action that took me to a situation where I started off thinking I was winning, and I took some move and now discovered that I'm in a situation where I'm losing. So probably that was a bad move. And so that's the intuition here. We're now going to plug in that TD error as an unbiased sample estimate of the, of the advantage function. Um, and the nice thing about this is that we only need to estimate V in our critic. We don't need to estimate Q. We just need to estimate the state value function. There's no actions that come into it. Um, and, and what we do is we just plug in. So this would actually be another way to rewrite our policy gradient theorem. Again, this is just a rewriting of the policy gradient theorem. We haven't changed anything. There's no approximation yet. But if we use a critic to estimate v, if we use a v hat now instead of the true v pi, and we use the TD error based on our, our approximate TD, on, uh, based on our approximate um, value function, and we just plug in that, that estimate of, of, of the TD error there, then we end up with something which is a good approximation to this policy gradient theorem. That's a practical algorithm. We estimate v, we generate TD errors using our v, and we move in the direction of those TD errors. And we only need one set of critic parameters V to do that. 
Okay. So just um, a couple more ideas to throw in for the, this family of different things that you can try. And then I'll summarize and just bring them all back together. I've got one slide at the end that hopefully is just like a summary where you can come back and say, you know, these are the different things that you can do with Active Critic. Um, so this one is really just a, um, a reminder of, of, of the previous lectures, which is to say, you know, what about, what about this idea of eligibility traces and different timescales? So if you remember from the previous lectures, we've often reused this idea that you don't always want to go all the way to the end of the episode and estimate the return, and neither do you necessarily just want to take one step and bootstrap from the value function after one step, because that, that's biased. And you often want to trade off the bias invariance between these two, two things using something like TD Lambda. So now we're going to do the same thing with actor critic algorithms, but it turns out that it's quite straightforward to do that. Um, so if you remember from last lecture, we had a choice of things that we could plug in. So this is last lecture. You could plug in when you were updating your value function approximator. You could plug in the return. You could plug in your one-step TD target. You could plug in your lambda return. You can make any of these the target um, for, your, for your updates. And then we also had this idea of eligibility traces, which basically gave a backward view that was equivalent to plugging in this lambda um, return in the forward view. So hopefully this is starting to become a little bit familiar. Uh, if it's not, then go back to the notes, because um, it's, um, it's, it's useful stuff, a key idea. So what we're going to do now is do, plug in exactly the same idea to our actors. So, I mean, first of all, we should say that you can, you can do all this with, um, with the critic. Um, and, sorry, I think some of these should say V rather than W. But you can do all of this with the, um, with the critic, where you can basically, you know, I, I, as I mentioned before, the critic, we can evaluate our policy by any means we like. We can plug in any algorithm we want for our policy evaluator. It could be TD0, it could be Monte Carlo, it could be TD Lambda least squares, policy evaluation, any of these are valid. And, and, and so we can introduce different time scales onto our critic um, by choosing a TD lambda on eligibility trace. But that doesn't affect the actor yet. It doesn't affect the actor. And the question is, can we also get these different time scales on the actor? Can we get information to flow back more efficiently in the actor so the actor's not just based on this, the current TD error, but based on something which bootstraps from all different time steps? And the answer is yes. Um, and so very briefly, all we're going to do is basically um, we're going to plug in. So this is, again, our, our original. This is the true policy gradient theorem. The score multiplied by the value function, or the advantage function, equivalently. Um, and what we're going to see is that there's different things which we can plug in so far. We've seen two different examples. We've seen that we can do the Monte Carlo policy um, gradient, um, which looks something like this, where we plugged in the return. So we, we use the return multiplied by the score as our estimate, and we subtract off some baseline here. So if we always just subtract off this baseline value function here, we end up with a return minus this, this, this value function multiplied by the score. When we used um, the TD error, we ended up with the, the one-step target, the TD target, the reward plus the discounted value at the next step, minus our baseline. Okay, so these are different targets. When we use the Monte Carlo target, we end up plugging in the return. When we use um, this TD error version, where we're estimating the advantage function using the TD error, we plug in the TD target and subtract off the, the value function as a baseline. So these are equivalent. Um, these are different. Sorry, these are different ways to estimate our original policy gradient theorem. These are different approximations, um, and sometimes. It's a good idea to do this. This is a high variance, low bias estimator of the, of the policy gradient. And sometimes it's a good idea to th do this, where we introduce bias by bootstrapping from our value function, uh, but we dramatically reduce the variance. And again, the goal is to, to get the best of both worlds, where we want to come up with a gradient estimate which bootstraps from our, value, from our critic all kinds of different time steps. We don't just want to rely on our critic at this time step to, to estimate the gradient. We want to use the critic so we want to be able to say, well, the critic at this time step says I should go this way. The critic at the next time step says I should go this way. So what we really want to do is to combine these together and actually move in some combined direction. Um, and so that's the idea of using eligibility traces. And it's exactly analogous to the way we do it in value-based reinforcement learning, where we compute our TD error, we build up an eligibility trace. And the eligibility trace now um, basically is an eligibility over our scores. 
So we basically remember all of the scores that we've seen recently. Um, and so if I had a high score for this particular action in this particular state, uh, we remember that, we bump up our eligibility trace, and then later on when we come to make an, a, an update, uh, we move in the direction where the, the scores have been largest most recently and, and most frequently. So the way to understand this is, the best way to understand this is by analogy with the eligibility traces in the value-based case, where you can literally look at the updates and you can see that wherever you had an eligibility trace in the value-based case, um, the updates were identical. Like if we were doing value-based reinforcement learning, we would look at, say, our lambda return um, minus our current value, and we'd have just multiplied directly by the gradient of that value function, not by the score. And so all we need to do is like a search replace. Wherever we had the gradient before, we search replace with the score, and that will actually work and give us a, a legitimate eligibility trace instead. OK. Um, so summary of this idea, so we're building up our toolkit of ideas that help us to make um, Act Critic effective in practice. So now we've got a new piece to our toolkit, which is el eligibility traces, how to make our actor make use of critics from many different steps all the way into the future. And the nice thing about this approach as well is that unlike Monte Carlo policy gradient, we can apply this online. We can um, basically use critics that, that build up um, things going far, far into the future, but we can do it online, and we can apply this in incomplete sequences or in, in situations where, um, where the environment is continuing, never stops, or in situations where we're working off policy. <coughs> Okay. Um, so I think what I'm going to do is I'll talk very briefly about this. So there's a really important question in actor critic algorithms, which is, in some sense, you know, it should be the first question that you ask about actor critic algorithms, which is that we've used this critic and we just kind of said, um, let's replace the true critic value with the, some approximation to that critic value. And we just plugged in that thing and hoped that the gradient that we follow is still correct. In other words, we, we started off by deriving the policy gradient theorem. We said, this is the true gradient to follow if you really want to improve your policy. And then we substituted in something. We substituted in a critic. And we said, OK, well, you should follow what the critic says instead of the true value function. But how do we know that that's valid? How do we know that this really is pushing us in the correct gradient direction, and we're not actually following some bogus gradient. Um, and the answer is that, amazingly, if you choose the value function approximation carefully that you use, it's possible to pick a value function approximator that doesn't introduce any bias at all. In other words, despite the fact that we don't have the true value function, and that we're approximating the value function, we can still follow the true gradient. We can be guaranteed to follow the true gradient with our policy updates. Um, and that approach is called compatible function approximation. Um, and compatible function approximation, I won't go into the details of it, but the main idea is to say that the features that we use to have a compatible function approximator, the features that we use are themselves um, the score function. We basically build up uh, features for our critic where the features are the score of our policy. And if we use that particular type of feature, and we use linear combination of those features, then we actually guarantee, um, according to the theory on this slide and the following slide, which I'll leave to look at afterwards, we can actually guarantee that we don't affect the policy direction, that we actually still follow the true gradient direction if we follow these compatible features. OK. Now, I know that I'm throwing a lot of ideas at you, and there's a big soup of possible things to follow. I want to throw in one last idea. Um, this is a recent idea. I think it's a useful idea to know about. Um, and, and it's just this one slide, which is to say that so far we've considered these stochastic policies. We've considered these policies like a Gaussian policy, where we say, you know, I want the mean of my policy to be this thing, and I'm sometimes going to take the actions which are like the mean, and sometimes I'm going to perturb it a little bit by some noise. Um, but this thing can be very, very noisy. Like we're actually, so far, we've been estimating our policy gradients by sampling our own noise. We've basically got a noisy policy, and we want to take an expectation over that noise. And it turns out that taking expectations of the gradient of our own noise can be a really bad idea. 
that this thing is really, really hard to estimate. And in fact, if you start off with like a Gaussian policy, and you start to improve this thing over time, and you'd hope it would start to narrow down as you start to figure out how to solve the problem, but as this Gaussian becomes narrower and narrower and narrower, the variance of your estimates actually starts to blow up to infinity. Like it turns out that estimating the policy gradient becomes harder and harder and harder. The noise basically hurts you more and more and more as you get better and better and better at finding the right policy. And that's sort of an unfortunate property of the policy gradient algorithms we've seen so far. Um, turns out that there's an alternative, and this is something we did um, uh, last year, uh, which is to work directly with the limiting case. So instead of adding noise into our policy and then trying to narrow this noise down to something which is roughly deterministic, what if we just start off with deterministic policies? So we're going to start off with some deterministic policy, um, and we're going to adjust the parameters of this policy, this deterministic policy, so as to get us more objective. We're going to follow the same objective functions we did before. And it turns out that um, if you just take the limiting case of the policy gradient theorem that we've seen so far, you end up with this very, very simple update, which has a slightly different form to what we've seen so far. But it, again, you should think of this as just another rewrite. This, again, is exactly equivalent. It's just the limiting case when we actually consider a deterministic function where we've narrowed our noise down to zero. Basically, just got a deterministic function now. We're just picking the mean always. We're never adding any noise in. And it has this particularly nice form where we say all we need to do to follow the gradient to adjust the parameters of this policy, this should have a, a u there as well, if we just want to adjust the parameters of this policy to get more objective, all we need to do is to um, take the gradient of our own q function. So we look at our critic. Our critic basically tells us, hey, look, you know, if you were, um, it gives us the gradient that says, this is the way that will give you better actions. It says, actually, look, this is how you, this only works for continuous action spaces, by the way. But it basically says, here's the gradient of your value function with respect to your actions. This is how, if you were just to make this action here a little bit higher, you would get more reward. If you were to make this other action a little bit lower, you'd get less reward. So the critic already contains all that information about how to adjust the actions so as to get more or less reward. So that's all there in the gradient of Q. That tells you how to get more reward. Like just, you know, just move left a little bit more, and you'll get a lot more reward. That's, that's this gradient of Q. And then all you need to do is to work out how to adjust your parameters so as to get more of those actions which, are, which the critic is suggesting. And so that's the gradient of the policy here. So this is just the chain rule. It's the chain rule. It says, adjust the policy in the direction that gets you more Q. And so that's the deterministic policy gradient theorem. It's very simple, intuitive, and in practice it seems to work a lot better than stochastic policy gradient um, in situations where we've got continuous action spaces. Scales up much better to high dimensions. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip the natural um, actor critic. Um, so there's one more approach, which is in the notes, which is the natural actor critic. Um, the natural actor critic is an alternative descent direction or ascent direction. Um, which has some nice properties, and it turns out it falls out very nicely in the actor critic framework. That's there in the notes. Feel free to refer to it. Um, but I wanted to put up this summary slide before we finish. Um, and this is like a summary of all the different manipulations that we've done um, to, our, uh, <coughs> to our different actor critic algorithms. So we started off with basically our policy gradient theorem. And what we did was we plugged in different approximations to this thing. Um, where we said, okay, the gradient of our, of our policy, we can get it by taking the score function and multiplying it by, by the return. Uh, we can multiply it by the value function. We can multiply it by the advantage function, so that should be a D. Um, we can multiply it by the TD error. This was another way to estimate the advantage function. We take a sample of the advantage using the TD error. Um, we can use an eligibility trace where we accumulate our scores. Instead of just using the current score, we accumulate an eligibility over all of our scores over many time steps. And we use that eligibility trace instead of just the one current score. Um, and we can use the deterministic actor critic where we basically move in the direction that gets us more Q. Okay, All of these are essentially different variants of the same idea. They're all different ways. They're different manipulations of trying to say, move the policy in the direction that gets you more value. And then the way that we estimate value using the critic 
um, is what varies here. Um, and the way that we make use of this, how we update our policy, is what varies between here and here and here. So the, the critic can vary, the actor can vary, but essentially they're all doing roughly the same thing. And for each of these cases, we can make a stochastic gradient ascent algorithm where essentially all we do is we just drop this expectation by sampling the thing which is inside. And in each case, you end up with a very, very straightforward, simple algorithm where all you do is you, you take a step or an episode if you're doing the top one, um, and you look at what happened in that one step only. Um, we now have the gradient of the score for that step. We took an action from some state. We know for that state how to have adjusted our policy so to so as to have taken that action more often. And we look at whether that step was good or bad, according to our critic. If it's good, we push our policy parameters to do that thing more often. So all of these have very simple stochastic updates. Um, and then the critic, we basically use our favorite algorithm, Monte Carlo, TD, TD Lambda. You know, it's the whole family of different approaches that we've, we've considered before in previous lectures. OK, that's it. Any last questions before we? Um, in the last 30 seconds. <laughs> okay, thanks everyone. <laughs>